You come for Simon, you stay for Baz. That's how Carry On works. Hello friends, my name is Lauren and welcome back to my channel. Today I have finally, 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 after months, I have a book review. I'm happy to say it that I finally have read it, I annotated it, I wrote some awesome notes, and now here we are ready to discuss, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are reviewing, as you already know from the title, Carry On by Rainbow Rowell. Now, if you guys know anything about Carry On, you know that it's the fan fiction based off of Fangirl. So the main character, Cass, I believe, writes fan fiction, and her fan fiction is this story. And so Rainbow Rowell decided to write the full fledged novel version of the fan fiction from her other novel, if that makes sense. I started Fangirl last year and I started to annotate it, but as you can tell, I didn't get very far. This was actually the first book I ever tried to annotate. I remember enjoying it, but I just never finished it. However, I did really want to read Carry On for the longest time. I read it for the first time earlier this year and gave it four to five stars right off the bat. And now since Wayward Sun is coming out, if you're watching the day this video comes out on, it comes out in two days. So I'm really, really excited to read it. And so I wanted to remember all the details from this book. So hence, here we are now. Typically Rainbow Rowell writes like your typical like contemporary teenage romance book, I think. Best way to describe her as, but this is one of her first fantasy books, I believe. So that was kind of interesting just from like an author point of view to see how she's like taking a leap into something a little bit different and so I was kind of excited for that. I've only read Eleanor and Park of her other books and that was five years ago I want to say. So it's been a while since I've read anything Rainbow Rowell related. But this book I'm actually pretty happy with my reread for this book and we'll get into a few reasons why later on in this video. I'm gonna be talking about a lot of things throughout this video so if you want to check out certain key parts I'll link the timestamps down below if you want to just skip to a certain part. So grab a snack, a beverage, take a seat and we're gonna have some lit discussions. <laughs> if you have never heard of Carry On, I just want to read you the synopsis just so you get a basic understanding. Simon Snow is the worst chosen one who's ever been chosen. That's what his roommate Baz says. And Baz might be evil and a vampire and a complete git, but he's probably right. Half the time, Simon can't even make his wand work, and the other half, he starts something on fire. His mentor is avoiding him, his girlfriend broke up with him, and there's a magic eating monster running around wearing Simon's face. Baz would be having a field day with this if you were here. So that's the synopsis of the book. It gives you a little bit of understanding of where the book goes. I'll just go over a few non-spoiler thoughts. If you have not read this book and don't want to be spoiled, I'll just talk about a quick few things now. So my rating for this book. I finished the book earlier this year. As I said, I read it on audiobook originally and I gave it a four to five stars. I really enjoyed the world. I wouldn't have put it on a five star just because it wasn't like my all time favorite, but I definitely finished the book and was like, wow, that was really, really good. And upon my recent reread over the last couple weeks, I finished the book, this time a physical copy while annotating it, and I finished it and I was like, wow, this is a four star book again. I loved a whole lot of the elements in the story. The book is very character driven, and I liked a lot of the character moments we see. There's some good romance, some good discussion points I picked up on. I liked the writing and certain writing styles Rainbow Rowell has, especially in this book. And so there overall was a lot of good, like, structural things that were done well with this book, and also just left me with a whole lot of, like, great magical, awesome feelings. However, going back to my notes for this book, I I realized that there were some things that I forgot about after I finished it that I was like, I kind of want to address this. And so going back to my notes as a more critical reader, I'm not sure if I would give this book a three on that stance. So critical reader three, enjoyment by the end of the book four. So maybe I'll average out my rating as a 3.5. I'm not 100% sure at this moment. If you are looking for a book to simply enjoy, you enjoy the chosen one trope, you enjoy a magical world, you enjoy a very character driven story, you are gonna love this book. This book is often described as a Harry Potter fan fiction. So if you love Harry Potter, maybe check out this book. If you are a more critical reader and are going to something to not only like emotionally enjoy, but also like structurally enjoy, I'm not sure exactly how good you might find this book just because there are a few small things I might have changed but we're gonna discuss that all in this video. I don't really have too much more to say that's in the non-spoiler section so I'm gonna be jumping into the spoilers so if you do not want to be spoiled for this book now it's time to click off the video. Are we good? Okay, great. By the way, I have my laptop and like notes going. So if you see anything like that, it's probably just because I've written like 10 pages of notes. So gotta reference that every so often. So if you see me looking anywhere, that's what it is. We're gonna start off the review with writing. Overall, I did enjoy it. It was like simple, straightforward. The dialogue between the characters was really good. So just from an overall sense, I really did enjoy the writing. I did notice a lot of Harry Potter vibes. Not sure if it was done on purpose, but I can't imagine that it was 
not done on purpose. So, especially at the very beginning of the novel, right on page four, we have Simon's best friend, Penelope, and Simon, the main character speaking, saying, it's Bounty Hunter, I said to Penelope the first time we fought one. No, it's Bounty Hunter, she replied. So, I feel like that's low-key a play off Wingardium Leviosa when Hermione and Ron are talking. So, I saw that and was like, Harry Potter. Wingardium Leviosa. You're saying it wrong. It's Leviosa, not Leviosa. Next, on page five, we get a little insight to the previous years at Watford. This is between like Baz and Simon. Simon says, it was when we were fighting the Chimera in the woods during our fifth year. It had us cornered and Baz wasn't powerful enough to fight it alone. Basically, all I got from this is that kind of like every year at the end of the school year, the villain in the story, the humdrum, sends like a new creature to attack Watford. And so I kind of found that similar to Harry Potter as like at the end of every school year, there's some like Voldemort thing. As well as on page 47, we hear the mage talking to Simon when he was 11 years old. He says, you're too young to hear this, Simon. 11 is too young, but it isn't fair to keep any of this from you any longer. So essentially, it's like the same magical age as it is in Harry Potter. And so I was like, you know, comparisons. Uh, also, one more thing is that throughout the story, Baz, one of the main characters called Simon Snow instead of his first name, which is Simon. Just like in the movies, Draco calls Harry Potter the whole movie. So I was like, that's a little bit of like nickname similarity as well. So I'm not sure how totally similar you are to Harry Potter, but I just noticed them. Scared Potter. Sing Potter. Something else about the writing is that I liked the foreshadowing bits in there. You wouldn't have really noticed it, I don't think, if you hadn't read the book already, but going back and seeing these again, I really, really enjoyed them. On page 63, Simon and Penelope watch another student get a visiting from one of their family members, and flash forward like multiple pages later, Simon actually ends up getting a visiting from Baz's mom. So I was like, oh, so you get introduced to the idea before, and then it happens several pages later. One foreshadowing part that I absolutely loved is on page 90. And it's between Eb, the goat herd at Watford, and Simon. Simon's talking to Eb about Baz and how he's not here and he doesn't know where he is. She says, her face falls. Did we lose someone? Eb's brother died when they were young. And so we learn that Eb's brother died young, which is a key part to the novel as, you know, Nicodemus is the vampire that kind of leads us to the answer in the story. We'll jump on that later, but I liked those foreshadowing bits. Something I absolutely loved in this book was Lucy. Her perspectives really elevated this book to like a whole other level, and I loved her flashbacks. They were written almost as if you were reliving them, but they were still flashbacks. Normally in stories, I don't really like flashbacks, but for some reason in this book, I really did enjoy them. They enhanced the story, you learned valuable information about a character you might not have known otherwise about, and I just overall really Liked it. We learn a lot about Davy, which is also the mage as we figure out later on in the story, and just hearing how he was in the past with Lucy and how we kind of progressed, like not as a good person, but kind of taking his good intents and becoming like a villain because of them. Absolutely phenomenal in Rainbow Vowels part. I loved it so much, and I love the fact that Lucy was communicating to the reader through the veil, which was just so so cool for like the reader to experience. I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed that part. So definitely some great like small writing things in there. Honestly can't complain anything in the writing portion of this video. I enjoyed basically all the writing and all the little tidbits in there. Writing for me was pretty solid in this book. Next, we're gonna jump on to the magic system in the world. So I do think that the magic in this world was well explained and mostly well done. You can understand who has magic and who doesn't as Simon is like the only person that's ever been born with no magical family. However, we find out like that isn't true. He got the spells, which are just like words with magic in them, certain words that humanity has just taken and made special. We also have a few concepts of magic in there that are still being explored from just magicians in general, such as when people do simple spells with magic, people call it like a waste of magic, as if magic is eventually going to run out. Also how siblings might split magic, and so I also thought those two like concepts are really cool, as even like the people in the world are still trying to figure out magic. I do wish, however, we got more of it, but we'll talk about that later. I also really 
really liked how everyone's magic feels different. I'm just gonna jump back to my notes for this one. So for Simon, for example, like the most powerful mage of all time, he describes his magic as going off like a bomb. Penelope describes her magic as like a well. She sees the well and she just imagines pulling the magic out of the well and then there it is. For Agatha, it feels like flexing a muscle. For Baz, it feels like lighting a match or pulling a trigger. Also that one line, oh my god, that one line I feel like also foreshadows to like that event, you know, that event later on in the story, but oh my god. Anywho, so magic feels different for everyone, which I thought was really cool because obviously like the most iconic magic system like that that's similar to Carry On is Harry Potter. And one thing that's also different in this book is not everyone uses a wand, they just use like a magical object. So it has to be like related back to your magical family for it to like really work. And so Simon has a wand, Baz has a wand, I believe. Penny uses a ring, someone uses like a belt buckle which is interesting to say the least, but I like how it's like takes a different complete form and isn't just like all wands like it is in Harry Potter. I think it adds a little bit of an interesting spin on the typical magical system we think of. Also for the magic system, we obviously have to talk about the humdrum. The humdrum is the villain in the story, in case you forget. He appeared 20 years ago and essentially sucks magic out of the universe. Magic is already considered to be relatively rare to begin with, and so the humdrum is essentially making geographical places have no magic magic anymore, so magicians can't access their magic in these holes. That's a huge problem in the world as magicians are called magicians because they use magic. It's for a reason. And so the humdrum is essentially something we follow, which I'll get to in a few minutes, but he essentially just leaves holes in the magical atmosphere. And the magic system in the world revolves around that as well as many magicians can't live in those dead spots anymore because they can't do anything about it. They can't use their magic for anything. And so it was definitely a cool element to add, not just for like a plot element, for like that geographical sense as well that magicians are having to move and all that kind of stuff. And also something, while the humdrum takes magic out of the world, Simon is known as the mage that's going to fix this. He's going to fix the magical world and bring solutions to all these problems. And Simon can actually do what no other magicians can, which is make anything happen with his magic. I'm gonna jump to page 194. When Penelope and Simon were fighting something, I believe last year, Penelope says this, big bony wings burst out of his back. Sort of wings, mishapped and overly feathered with too many joints. There's no spell for that. There are no words. Simon just said, I wish I could fly, and he made the words magic. Magicians aren't genies. We don't run on wishes. If anyone knew Simon could do that, they'd have burned him at the stake. So just to say, this is not a common or ever heard of thing in magicians. The magic system is based off like of rules, obviously, and Simon just kind of knocks all those rules out of the way and just kind of does what he wants. So we can almost see from like early early on how the humdrum and Simon could be connected in that way, but obviously we only learn that officially at the end. Now we're going to talk on to world building. So other than Watford, the world of like our world that we know now and the world from Carry On are essentially the exact same world other than the fact that there's a magical school. Watford is the only place that magicians typically live together outside of like their families. Something that dives into not the physical world but like the political system of the world is the tension between the mage and the old families such as the pitches and so that I thought was really cool how there's like a tension between it as Baz's mom was originally the mage before the mage became the mage and there's some tension between them and how the old families kind of want to overthrow the mage but haven't like fully acted on it yet. The mage is trying to do everything he can to keep his position and so I kind of like that world setup in a sense how even though this book is totally based on these few characters we also have like a background of some political things going on which can also make a difference in the end of the story. One thing I will say, however, which I was going to jump into later, but we might as well talk about it now, is how the book is kind of written as a fan fiction. So this point actually comes up from Goodreads. I was looking to see what other people were saying about the book, and I found this comment from Alexi, and she said something along the lines of how this book is written as a fan fiction, in a sense, where you come into the story already knowing things about the world. When I read this, I definitely agreed. There's no history of why everything came to be. The magic wasn't too exciting, as it was very, very simple, and the previous adventures didn't really add much to the story. Just to expand off her point there, you don't really get a whole lot of background information on Watford of a magical world. You get a little bit, but not a lot. And then also on like, 
Simon, Baz's, and Penny's like past adventures or just like attacks on them. We don't get like a whole lot of information on them other than the fact that they happened. We get a little bit of snippets in there, but it feels like we should have like experienced them a little bit more to really grasp the understanding of the world. But it is kind of like we're thrown in there, like we should already know these things. And so that was something I saw and just was like really resonated with me after reading the book. And so I do wish that we got a little bit more world building information just on how everything came to be and what it could look like in the future. Just a little bit more information I thought could have elevated the story. Now we're going to go to the plot section of this book and this was probably like my most problematic area. Not even problematic but like something I dislike the most. I will be referencing my notes a lot for this section just because I do have quite a few things to say but I made a list okay of all the major plot points in the book okay. There's around 20-25 dot shots here and around five of them have to do with actual plot things okay. There is not as much plot as I would have liked in the story. I understand that it is a very character driven story but even at that sense it's only really driven by like Simon and Baz and in that case mostly Baz. The story really here is Baz okay. You come for Simon you stay for Baz. That's how carry on works. The ending of this book oh my god so I didn't really see it coming like you can kind of piece together with the mages behind it through small details but seeing it all unfold is so cool okay the mage is literally losing his mind by the end of it he's like this is our only chance the families are coming for me the humdrum is doing his worst yet again i have to get magic i can do it myself he thought he was going to be the magician to save everyone he's sprinkled in thoughts about how simon was the chosen one but he's just broken he can't be fixed and so then he ends up killing eb to use her magic because he doesn't have enough and eb wouldn't use it herself and then in the end like simon's so confused he's like he sees his like father figure mentor person literally killing one of his friends and it's like super intense not gonna lie but then Simon ends up kind of saving the day even though it was his fault in the beginning I mean it's kind of weird that he now has wings and a tail and has no magic but I don't know I feel like he worked hard to get to this point of where he could finally fix the problem everyone's kind of been putting on him to solve and so I felt that was really good for Simon and it also brought the downfall of the mage which I thought was good. Poor Agatha getting roped into there too that was so sad. It was a good ending. It was a solid ending and it kind of tied everything together. It was very dramatic. I liked it. Seeing the mage's downfall was cool and Simon finally doing what he was supposed to do all along I guess was really cool to see. So even though this is a very character driven story I almost would have preferred a more plot driven story or have it more equal out just because I found that since this book is 500 and in some odd pages we could have done for a little bit more plot rather than just character based stuff especially when those two characters weren't really doing all that much for a lot of the book I'm just saying like Baz is gone for 150 pages we only meet Baz in part two of the story which is 150 pages in however a good example of this I want to talk about is A Darker Shade of Magic by V.E. Schwab basically my all-time favorite series so take A Darker Shade of Magic and since Essentially the plot for this book are four different worlds with four levels of magic essentially and our two main characters Kel and Lila are essentially trying to take the magic from one world that they accidentally got and put it back where it belongs in one of the other worlds. This book is very 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 character driven but also has a very sustainable plot behind it. With this book they're trying to return dark magic to its like dark realm while in this book you're led to believe that the main conflict is trying to get rid of the humdrum which it is. Then you get to like the 150 point when you learn that Baz's mom comes and visits Simon and kind of leaves Simon this information for Baz and then that whole plot kind of takes over the whole book and you think that the humdrum is a more pressing issue and it would be addressed more but it's not really that addressed if you really think about it. It's mostly just Simon and Baz and Penelope and Agatha kind of thrown in there trying to figure out why Baz's mom came back and who Nicodemus is. It doesn't really connect back to the humdrum other than the fact that it could be the humdrum but that's it. I didn't really like how the book led you to believe the main plot which is the humdrum was the main plot but then it becomes a side plot but then they tie together in the end. I didn't really like that to be honest. Like in the end it's cool how they tie together but I wasn't a huge fan of it just getting to that point just because I was like I came for one conflict and ended up getting another. Just to give you an idea from the first page to page 146 we seem to believe that the humdrum is the main conflict and that's what Simon and Baz and whoever else are going to be fighting towards. However we then find out that the conflict switches over to Baz's mom and that's where the characters kind of spend most of their time. On page 374 we actually learned the plots are connected. So we essentially 
take over 200 pages, an addition to what we've already read. So 374 pages of this book before we learn that the two seemingly random plots are actually connected. And that's like a long time to wait to realize that things are connected, you know? Like, I don't know if it's just me, but that's my thoughts. I know Rainbow Rowell writes mostly contemporary, and I believe this is one of her first, if not her first, fantasy novel. And so obviously if she's gonna write fantasy again, there's obviously things for her to learn and figure out. However, I wish there were more fantasy elements in this fantasy novel, because as much as it is about the characters and the romance between the characters, it is taking place in a magical school. Give me more magic, not just more magic. Give me good magic, okay? I wish there was more of it. Don't get me wrong, there's lots of great character scenes in this book that make up for it and also some interesting parts with the magic however like going back to a darker shade of magic while it is a very character driven story we do spend a lot of the novel still learning about the different worlds and what it means to be in each world this book however it's like we get a little bit of information at the beginning a few tidbits in the novel but not that much overall for a page that's 500 plus pages and so I wish there was more magic in the magical story so overall, even though there was a lot of like action and some magical things in there, I just wish there was more of it to balance out the amount of character-driven stuff in this novel. It still can be a great character-driven novel, but I wish we just saw more magic. Next, we're jumping on to probably the largest section in this book, which is the character, but specifically the relationship part of the story. Not the romance, but the different character relationships the characters have between them. Whether it's enemies, whether it's friends, whether it's family, whatever it may be, we're talking about it. We're gonna start off with the obvious choice, which is Simon and Baz, our two main protagonists. I'll save my anger on something for a little bit later, but we only hear about Baz through Simon, and Baz doesn't come officially into the novel till page 150 when he returns from the school in the most dramatic way possible, I love it, but we only hear about Baz from Simon. And the only thing we really hear about Baz from Simon's perspective is one, that he's like a complete git, he sucks, he's tried to kill him a whole bunch of times, and also that Simon's very, very, very obsessed with him. Why is he obsessed with him? We don't know, but here we are. So when you hear Simon talking about Baz, you hear how much it sounds like he hates him. He's definitely obsessed with Baz, but it definitely doesn't sound like a positive obsession, if that's the thing. It just sounds like he doesn't like him. However, when we are introduced to Baz, like he comes back and we have his perspective, it's clear to the reader that Baz finds Simon very dramatic, but also really cares about him. And even a couple pages later, it admits his love for Simon to the reader. Just reading my notes, he's mad at himself for how much he loves Simon, and even though Baz has kind of done a couple bad things to Simon, quite easy for the reader to pick up on his feelings. Simon, on the other hand, not so much. So Simon also talks about how Baz tried to kill him a couple times, and then Baz goes over the same couple points, and he only actually ever tried to kill Simon once. And so if you think about it, it's fine, and he didn't really mean to kill him, he just tried to take away his voice. But that was kind of like his own internal thing, because he didn't want to be gay and like Simon, but then he did. So I don't know, there's whole that situation. Was that wrong on Baz's part? Yes. Is Simon also stupid? Yes. So there we go. However, these people become a couple in the book. And when I originally listened to the book a couple months ago, first time listening to it, I did not pick up on Simon's feelings at all for Baz. And so I was like, this time, I'm gonna look for key things that like, you know, talk about Simon, you know, kind of liking Baz. There's not one single thing in the book. Other than the fact that he's obsessed with him and like, low-key compliments at him like once, that's not really like some way to describe liking someone like that just me i i don't know but you know i think if you like someone you would like you know think positive thoughts about them you would like try to talk to them i'm just saying like the first scene we see a romantic interest from the both of them is after Baz and Simon meet Nicodemus, Baz sprints out, takes Simon with him, they go drive somewhere else. Baz lights a fire and essentially tries to kill himself. And then, and only then, does Simon kiss him. Which, first of all, is very overlooked in the whole book. I feel like people just miss the fact that Baz tried to do that to himself, but was saved by Simon kissing him. Back, let's jump to this part. Oh my god, you literally have to wait the whole book. You have to get over 350-ish pages to get to the part where the romance actually starts. Oh my god. This book, I feel, could have been written in less pages. I'm just saying. I'm just gonna read you a page or two from this part just because I feel it captures a lot. 
of my feelings, okay? So this is Baz's perspective. That's it. I'm gonna have to spell this imbecile away for me. My last deed will be to save Simon Snow's life, and my whole family will be ashamed. He's holding on to my face, expecting me to stay alive just because he told me to. Because he's Simon Bloody Snow, and he gets whatever he wants if he growls loud enough. I think I might kiss him before I send him flying. I think I might kiss him. He's right here, and his lips are hanging open, mouth breeder. And his eyes are alive, alive, alive. You're so alive, Simon Snow. You got my share of it. He shakes his head and says something, and I think I might kiss him. Because I've never kissed anyone before. I was afraid I might bite. And I never wanted to kiss anyone but him. I won't bite, I won't hurt him. Just want to kiss him, and then go. Simon, he trails off. I say, and then he kisses me. And I was like, shook, shook to my core, shook to my core, because Simon didn't show any romantic interest in Baz whatsoever. And like, if you think about it, you think you would have seen something. Like, if your frenemy was about to die and kill themselves, is your first instinct to save them to kiss them or to hug them or hold their hand or take them away? or reason with them, it's not to kiss them. Like, that's like a full-on romantic thing. I, I can't imagine anyone else feels differently than that, but let's read some more. Simon, I just wanted to shut up and stop talking like this. I just wanted to get up and follow me out of here. I just want to be back at Watford in our room, knowing he's there and that he isn't hurting anyone and no one is hurting him. If Baz thinks I'm ever letting him go, he's wrong. I like him like this, under my thumb, under my hands, not off plotting and scheming and talking to vampires. I've got you now, I think. I finally got you where I want you. And so I'm so confused because Simon just sounds like evil, low key, even though he's not, but Simon didn't show any romantic interest in Baz whatsoever. Oh, I'm, I'm tired. I can't, I can't do this. More or less, the relationship between Simon and Baz was interesting, okay? The relationship from Baz to Simon was definitely straightforward. It was good. I liked it. From Simon to Baz, I wish we would have gotten a slight more romantic interest from Simon shown to the reader. I honestly saw nothing and I was looking for it. And so in that case, it was kind of disappointing. Simon and Penelope, the main friendship of the book. Honestly, they're pretty solid the whole way through. They balance each other out really well. Penny's super smart. Simon builds off her ideas they work really really well together and have like similar visions and what's like the best idea and way to go which I really thought was good I liked how there was like no romantic interest in them like the whole book even Penny says to Agatha a couple times like girl like I don't like your man like I don't I'm being honest with you like there was literally nothing between them and I was also like I was just like yes a solid friendship we love that just to compare them to someone I kind of thought Simon was like movie Ron and Penelope was like a more talkative Hermione in that sense just without the romantic interest Interest between them so I don't know not too much to say on them specifically but I really just enjoyed their friendship Simon and Agatha okay I am kind of conflicted on Agatha and her role in the story I think she adds an interesting perspective I'm just not sure how important she is to the story itself. So Simon and Agatha are dating when Simon gets back to school. However, neither of them really wants to be with the other. Simon just wants to happily ever after and Agatha just wants someone to love her now. Obviously those things conflict with each other. On page 73, Simon doesn't really care to hear about why like Agatha was speaking with Baz last year. He just wants peace. He just wants them to be good. So he says, I'd rather just move on, I say. It's not important. And it's just, Agatha, it's so good to see you. I reach for her hand. She lets me take it. It's good to see you too, Simon. I smile. She almost smiles back. Meaning like, she ain't happy, boy. Like, look, open your eyes. Take a look at her. She's clearly not happy with you. I'm just saying, okay? Then, not only two pages later, <laughs> we have Agatha's point of view. And this is on page 75. And she says, Simon's the chosen one. And he chose me. And even though I love him, we grew up together. He spends Christmas at my house. I do love him. It isn't enough. Whatever I feel isn't enough. It won't be enough when I lose him. I just don't love Simon enough. I don't love him the right way. Maybe I don't have that sort of love in me. Maybe I'm a defect. And if that's the case, I may as well stand by Simon, shouldn't I? If that's what he wants, if that's what everyone expects of me to be, if that's the only place I can make any difference. Agatha literally talks about her part about being the love interest in this story and I kind of like that in a sense, but I also like her perspective in general, just how she's a magician that doesn't really want to be a magician. She wants to be a veterinarian. She wants to live with her normal friends. She doesn't even care about magic all that much. I do like Agatha's perspective in general, just to get a different point of view. Simon and Agatha together weren't really that interesting. Not to mention their relationship 
relationship doesn't really heal or anything throughout the novel. It definitely takes place over like the whole school year, so I believe they could have been on better terms, but they don't really. And so after like the 150-ish mark when they break up, they're kind of boring together, just saying. Simon and the mage. Now this really interests me. Like Simon felt that the mage was the father he never had. And like it's kind of funny because the mage is technically Simon's father. We find out through Lucy in the end. But Simon kind of depends on the mage to be like that fatherly figure he never had. As he was like technically an orphan growing up, even though he's not, but that's what he was made to believe. So even though we learn that the mage has been his father all along, the mage only ever had Simon for his own purposes. He never did it to start a family with Lucy, and he never did it to like be able to raise someone to be a great person or you know, normal reasons people have kids. <laughs> and you think with all the mages like hopes and dreams on the line with Simon, he might have cared a bit more. There's one scene where the mage is trying to get Simon to go into like a safe house so the humdrum can't hurt him. But that's it. But the mage is very protective of Simon. I'm just gonna read a couple quotes here. But the mage sent me off to a new children's home just like he always does. I don't think he'd even let me go to school at Watford if he wasn't the headmaster there. And if he didn't think it was the safest place for me. The mage is either like out doing other things, doesn't talk to Simon very much, other things like that. And so if he really valued Simon, or at least trying to use Simon to fulfill his purpose that he created Simon for, I wish he was a little nicer to Simon, you know, because it, there wasn't really much of a good relationship between them. The mage and Lucy. Now, the mage, I definitely feel liked Lucy in the beginning. However, he started to just use her. And I honestly really like the mage's character because I feel he's someone that has like strong motives and turns them upside down. So he believed that all magicians were equal as originally only magicians with very strong magical powers were let into Watford. However, he believed that everyone with even a slightest bit of magic opportunity should be able to go to Watford and learn their magic and get better at it, even if they only had a little bit. There's a quote in the book, I can't find it, but it's basically like, should we only teach poets to read? And I thought that was really good because he wants to make sure everyone has the opportunity to learn more about their magic and become better at it, even if they only have a little bit. And so eventually when he does become the mage, he like enforces that rule. So even Bass, who's a vampire, gets in. There's students with less magical talent, but get in as well. And so I just find that really cool, how he had all these good intentions from the start. However, then he started to get like obsessed, okay? He started to get obsessed with power and trying to figure out the solution until he finally used his girlfriend to have a kid so he could raise to make the savior of the world, okay? And so I'm like, that's good in theory, you know? Make the savior all you want. But Lucy wanted a family with Davy, okay? She wanted happiness and she was just doing it because he seemed so happy at the time. However, she never told him how much pain she was in or all these kinds of things because she just wanted to make him happy. However, he never wanted to just make her happy. It was always about him first. And so you kind of see his transition to being a good guy to slowly like being the bad guy, even though his intentions still are the same. I hope that all makes sense, but it was really cool to read about. Simon, Baz, and Penelope. I kind of loved their little trio there where they would like work together to figure out like Baz's mom's visiting, all that kind of stuff. Even when Penelope compliments Baz's mom. On page 245 we kind of have this whole scene and I'm just gonna read a bit from it. So she says following him to the chalkboard, you got a visiting, an actual visiting. Natasha Grim Pitch was here. Baz glances back over his shoulder. You sound impressed Bunce. I am, Penelope says. Your mother was a hero. She developed a spell for no McFever and she was the youngest headmaster in Watford history. Baz is looking at Penny like they've never met. And and, Penny goes on, she defended your father in three duels before he accepted her proposal. That sounds barbaric, I say. It was traditional, Baz says. It was brilliant, Penny says. I read the minutes. Where, Baz asks her. We have them in our library at home, she says. My dad loves marriage rights, and in any sort of family magic, actually. He and my mother are bonded together in five dimensions. That's lovely, Baz says and I'm terrified to think he means it. She was a legend. So I like that Baz and Penelope no longer hate each other. I just loved it so, so much. And it was just so pure, like they worked together, they built this relationship, the three of them, and I just really liked it. And so I feel like Simon and Baz could have been great friends all along, Penelope as well. Agatha probably could have made better sense not going to watch it at all, but I liked the three of them together. I thought it was like the, their own version of the Harry Potter golden trio, Team Carry On. I really liked it and it didn't feel forced 
just felt good. The last relationship I want to talk about is Baz and his family. So Baz and his family, I love the different dynamics we have between them. I want to focus on three specific characters, his aunt Fiona, his father, and his mother. First off, he literally calls his aunt Fiona a badass, and I was like, yes, she is. There's a couple scenes in the book where she just kills it. I love her out there-ness, her passion. I loved it so much, and honestly, I loved hearing about her. She was a small side character that just really elevated the story. His father disliked his queerness more than him being a vampire. And I found that kind of interesting. There's literally a quote where on page 215, so this is Bass talking about after his family knew he was a vampire. They went on acting like nothing had happened. They're lucky I didn't start devouring people as soon as I hit puberty. I don't think my father ever would have mentioned it, even if he caught me draining the maid. Though he'd much prefer to catch me disrobing the maid. Definitely more disappointed in my queerness than my undeadness. Oh, I read that and I was like, Jeez, that's that's rough, man. I'm sorry, Baz. And then we also get the relationship between his mother, which is on the same page. So my father never acknowledges that I'm a vampire, besides my flammability. And I know he'll never send me away because of it. But my mother, she would have killed me. She would have faced me, what I am, and done what was right. My mother would never have let a vampire into Watford. She didn't. And so I was like, that's some very different dynamics in that family there. Obviously his mother died and that's a huge part of the plot. We have the different dynamic between the father and the mother and I just kind of found it really interesting just to see that different dynamic in the family. Again, just added an extra really cool element to the story, which I really enjoyed. I also just really enjoyed how he interacted with his family, how his family's one of like the older families so they do have like a lot of traditions. They dress really fancy, they get those good grades, you know, it's just kind of cool. And then I also liked when Simon came and visited his house and met his family, how everyone was kind of like taken aback and it was just so good. And I definitely just think that whole family aspect elevated the novel to like a whole other level. As for the characters themselves, I think you can get a sense of who they are as they interact with other people. Basically, Simon's dramatic, Baz is awesome, Penelope's very honest. Oh, Agatha, I really liked Agatha, especially near the end of the novel when we get her like final perspective. She ends up moving to California and really has made a connection with Eb. I never knew Eb. She was Simon's friend. I always thought she was Barmy, living in that shack, spending her days with goats. But I know more about her now. She was a powerful magician, but she didn't do what powerful magicians do. She didn't want to be in charge. She didn't want to control people or fight. She just wanted to live at Watford and take care of goats, and they wouldn't let her. Maybe I'll honor her memory by f right off the way she tried to. She told me to run. And that's exactly what she did, and she kind of has just taken the memories of Lucy, she's taken the memories of Eb, and kind of just like, you know, all these people have suffered. They didn't get to live the life they wanted to, and so now Agatha's making a point of trying to live her own life. We got the mage, which was a pretty solid character, just seeing his drive to see something awesome happen, and then it like made him a bad guy, I don't know. I have to say, I did like all the characters, I feel. I feel I did like all the characters. They all added something different to it. The only main thing that I just really wish there was more of was plot. It's a very character-driven story, but the characters were written, so who am I, who am I to complain? One of our last things we have is romance. Now this is normally one of my favorite parts in a novel because it can take it from just like a solid novel to being like, Yes, okay. So this book had pretty solid romance, okay? On page 137, it's Agatha's perspective and she's convinced that Baz kind of likes her. But I'll read you the line. I know that Basil, I don't know, thinks about me, or at least thought about me, that he used to watch me, especially when I was with Simon. I know he hated what Simon and I have and wanted it, that he'd do anything to get between us. Baz was always there, cutting in at every dance, teasing me away from Simon, then just teasing me disappearing, sneaking away. And so she thinks that's like Baz likes her, but it's actually Baz who likes Simon. She's the girlfriend that he wants to be, I guess. I don't know, but that was kind of cool. I liked that element there. Just added a little like twist to uncover later. Obviously we have the, and I'm hopelessly in love with him, iconic line on page 176. And he says this, and when I feel myself slipping too far, I held on to one thing that I'm always sure of. Blue eyes, bronze curls, the fact that Simon Snow is the most powerful magician alive, that Simon Snow is alive and I'm hopelessly in love with him. Oh, what a line, what a line. It's so good. I love Baz. Baz is probably the number one character for me in the story. He's amazing throughout the whole novel. Then we have this moment between Simon and Agatha. And this is what I mean when their relationship never really healed or got better at all. As Agatha says, my dad wants you to know that of course you're still welcome at our house for Christmas. Oh, I say good. But I think we both know how uncomfortable that would be. She goes on. She looks very uncomfortable just saying it for both of us. Right, I say. It would be uncomfortable, I guess. It would ruin Christmas, she says. 
I stopped myself before I could say, would it, would it really, Agatha? It's a big house and I'll stay in the TV room the whole time. Right, I say instead. The relationship kind of sucks, but like it also has a little bit of drama in there. And you know, we're here for that from time to time, okay? I already talked about the Baz killing himself scene, but Simon kisses him scene. I hated that. Like that scene was good. And I liked the way that scene was written when they kiss and finally like, I don't know, do that. But like, it feels like such a horrible moment to finally kiss him. At, you know, but there is this one part where they're talking and I thought it was better. Simon says, I like you, I say, and I don't even care that you don't like me. I'm used to it. I wouldn't know what to do if you did, but I like you, Baz. I like this. I like helping you. I like knowing that you're okay. When you didn't come back to school this autumn when you were missing, I thought I was going to lose my mind. Yeah, you thought I was plotting against you, he says. Yeah, I say, and I missed you. He shakes his head. There's something wrong with you. I know but I still want this, if you'll let me have it. Baz finally turns to look at me. What's this, Snow? This, I say. I want to be your boyfriend, your terrible boyfriend. And so I was like, that's a much purer, better moment than the kissing scene. You know, like, it was a good scene, but I wish it wasn't built behind, like, suicidal thoughts, you know? Like, that's not, I don't even know. Basically, in the end of the book, they slow dance together at like the end of graduation dance. They're they're good for each other. I don't know, I really liked it. There's also this quote at the front of the book here and it says, you were the sun and I was crashing into you. And I thought that was a good quote. On page 507, he says, the way you were before, Simon Snow, there wasn't a day where I believe we both lived through it. Through what? Life. You were the sun and I was crashing into you. I'd wake up every morning and think this will end in flames. And so, I don't know. I liked it. I like how chaotic it was, and I liked how it came together in the end. I also like right on the next page on 508. He says, I meet his glance and sneer. My arm is a steel band around his waist. I choose you, I say. Simon Snow, I choose you. Snow doesn't flinch or soften. For a moment, I think he's going to take a swing at me or bash his rock hard head against mine. Instead, he shoves his face into mine and kisses me. And so, I don't know. I like the way they end. I like the relationship. And I really want to see more of them in Wayward Son. Now that we're done talking about Carry On, I want to talk about Wayward Son. If you're watching this on the day it comes out, you know that the book is two days away from being released. I'm kind of really excited to read this book because as I just finished reading this book and talking about it for so long, literally like an hour and a half, I think, there are some key things I want to see happen. So first off, even though I know Agatha's going to be so mad about it, I want to see Agatha again. I know she moved to California and I know she wants nothing to do with the magical world. I want to see her again. I don't know how, but I want to see her again. I want Simon and Baz to not break up because they're the real ones. I want lots of Baz point of views because he is great. And I want to know who the next villain is essentially going to be. I know the book kind of follows them in America now and I know Agatha lives in America, so hopefully they get all reunited. I'm hoping like the main four starts to work together. Maybe Agatha will date someone new. We'll get to see a little bit of that. And I want to know who the new villain is. I do. Because the mage was kind of like the villain in the last book, even though he had good intentions, but he was the villain, if you think about it. I want to know who else the villain is or what's going to happen now that the humdrum is gone. I feel if the humdrum like comes back, that's going to be really weird because that makes literally no sense. But I want to know what happens with the villain. I want more magical insight to the world. Please, Rainbow Morale, fix what happened in this book and make it better for your next book because I want to know all the magical things. I want to see some secret magical underground world. I want something. I want backstory. I want to know more about Watford. I wonder if Watford is going to be even in it. So that means there's going to have to be a new magical setting. I wonder what that new magical setting is going to be. Okay, this is exciting. This is exciting. I really want to read this book. I'm probably going to do a review on it as well. So stay tuned for that. Also comment down below if you have any thoughts or what you think is going to be in the novel or what you want to see because I know I'm super hyped about it. Penelope. I want to see Penelope's boyfriend. I believe she still has the boyfriend throughout the whole book. I want to see the boyfriend, you know? Like I want to see Penelope be all lovey-dovey with someone because she's always just so smart and on top of everything. And I want to see that, you know, just that'd be so, so good. Oh my God, imagine a double date or Penelope and her boyfriend and Simon and Baz. That's gonna be literally the greatest thing ever. Please give me some pure date moments. Oh, oh my God, it'd be so good. It'd be so good. And yeah, ooh, this is a long video. Oh my God, if you're still here watching this video, you're a real one. Thanks for watching. What do you guys think of this book? Because I've said a whole lot of my thoughts. Overall, I enjoyed it. There were some things I wish were done a little better, but 
But as an overall thing, like, I enjoyed it. I really did, and I think it was well done. I think the characters are really good. There's some magical things and plot things I would have liked more of or to fix, but overall, I really did enjoy the story. Simon and Baz are just so good. I love them together, and I love all the points of views we see. I just think the story was really good. So that's kind of all I have to say about this book. If you enjoyed this review, be sure to give it a thumbs up and comment down below what you thought of the book, if you've read it, or what you thought of my review. It's been a while since I've done one, so please let me know. So I'll see you guys very soon with a new video. So until then, bye.